take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. Hi, I'm Robert Cassard. Happy you're with me today on Guitar Discoveries. As many of you know, I have been zeroing in on the individual Beatles and the debate about whether they were exceptional on their instruments or overrated. My answer has been very clear as I've been demonstrating what I learned from John Lennon, who for me was a brilliant rhythm and occasional lead guitarist. That's my most viewed video ever, at least so far, right up here. I also explored George Harrison and made the case for what a hugely influential guitarist he was and still is and why. So now it is Paul's turn. I mean, more than any other Beatle, Paul McCartney was a chameleon, you know, as a songwriter, a singer, a guitarist, and a bass player. He was the cute Beatle and his songs could be so sweet and bouncy, and he loved old-time music and vaudeville, so he brought that kind of variety show fun and sometimes campiness, right? And you can hear it in The Beatles and in his solo career and his years with Wings. Now, for some folks, that leads them to dismiss Paul and say, ah, uh, he's a lightweight, right? My wife, Bara, often falls into that group, so we have a good time debating the question of whether Paul is a lightweight or a heavyweight. I will say the Get Back documentary kinda changed her mind. Maybe not totally. Anyway, I make the case that no matter how you feel about Paul's schmaltzy side, you've got to acknowledge that First, he was half of the world's most beloved songwriting duo, and that he often contributed the really heavyweight stuff that made the Beatles a rock band. I'm gonna show you what I mean in this video. Now, like John and George, Paul wasn't a virtuoso in the modern sense, you know, being a speed demon and shredder type, but I argue he was a virtuoso ensemble player. He contributed exactly what each song needed to optimize it musically and really make it memorable. All right, stick around. I'm gonna share the three most important lessons I learned from Paul McCartney. First things first, please take just a moment to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you haven't already. I want you to know about future videos and to find out all the things I learned from other great guitarists. I'm even planning a Ringo episode and a George Martin episode, so don't miss them. So Paul started out as a guitarist with the Beatles, but he switched to bass right after the death of original member Stuart Sutcliffe. And because Paul was so often seen and heard playing bass, a lot of people don't even realize that he wrote the vast majority of his songs on guitar. In the early Beatles years, he and John sat across from each other with their acoustic guitars. And since Paul was left-handed and John was right-handed, they likened it to looking in a mirror. So John Lennon was considered the Beatles rhythm guitarist and George Harrison was their lead guitarist. But often, you know, thanks to multi-track recording technology, Paul would play bass and step in on certain guitar parts. And when I listened to Paul's parts, I realized that one of the key things he taught me was to play with attitude. Sometimes it's hard to tell exactly which parts and riffs are Paul's. So here are a few that might surprise you. The intro to Drive My Car. And the killer solo with slide at the end. the heavily bent lead guitar parts on Another Girl. Paul wrote and played the main guitar riff on Paperback Rider. The aggressive and driving guitar part on Birthday is Paul. And the lead guitar parts on Back in the USSR, also Paul. I mean, that is attitude. Usually when Paul stepped in on a guitar part, it was because George was, you know, subtle, deliberate, and more reserved in his playing. So if an electric guitar part needed to be a little wild, that was often Paul's territory. Okay, what about acoustic guitar? If there's one lesson I learned from Paul on acoustic, it's play your own way. He played acoustic in ways that sounded different from everyone else. And I think it's because he was mainly self-taught and just doing what he needed to get the sound 
out of his head and out of the guitar. So there are a few songs where Paul just did a standard strum using a flat pick, you know, like I'm looking through you. Or I've just seen a face and two of us. Standard down up strokes. But on some of Paul's signature songs, he ditched the pick and played a unique kind of finger picked or finger strum style that I've never heard anywhere else. I kind of think of it as thumb strum finger picking. On yesterday, his thumb plays a bass note on the downbeat followed by three quarter note upstroke strums or, or kind of like pulls. You can see this in a live clip from 1965. Paul kind of holds his hand in like a claw position and uses the flesh of his index and middle fingers to just pull the chords. I'm not half the man I used to be. Mother Nature's Son uses a similar pattern, but instead of a bass note on the downbeat, Paul plays a high melody note. It's like this one, two, and three, and four pattern. Born a poor young country boy. Then when he hits the B minor, he switches to playing the root of each note. Mother Nature's Son. You get the idea. So on Blackbird, he does the same one, two, and three, and four pattern, but he's got that chord progression that every guitarist has to learn at some point. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings, learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting this moment to arise. Something like that. So overall, Paul's style on acoustic really feels laid back and informal to me. And he doesn't mind leaving in some imperfections. And those are traits that he carried forward into his post Beatles solo and Wings albums too. You kind of hear that relaxed vibe on songs like Every Night from McCartney or Heart of the Country from Ram. Some People Never Know from Wildlife, Bluebird and Mamunia from Band on the Run and on and on. Okay, let's change gears to bass guitar where Paul is unquestionably in a class of his own. So what did I learn from Paul as a bass player? Well, it's gotta be the power of melodic bass lines. I mean, pretty much every musician raves about Paul's innovative bass parts. And this side of Paul really influenced me early on and it still does today when I'm producing music, you know, like my solo stuff or my band Cosmic Spin. I often ask myself, what would Paul do on this bass part? So growing up, I sang in choirs and quartets and madrigal groups, etc. And, and I played double bass in high school and college. So from singing and playing all those bass parts, I got used to the way a bass line supports and changes the character of the chords above it. And then how that low end contribution affects whole compositions and songs. So Paul obviously understood this too, and, and that might partly be because he was a church choir boy from about age 10 to 15. So he was certainly familiar with how bass was used in a more formal musical context. So when he switched from being a guitarist in the early Beatles period, he certainly knew the expected role of a bass player and the kind of simple role that bass usually played in a rock and roll rhythm section. I mean, it's mostly like root note and fifth, root note fifth over and over. And on some of those early songs, you know, Paul plays that expected role. But pretty soon he had to take it further and he developed this melodic style where each bass part embodies a unique melody in itself. So his approach to bass was more intricate and definitely less expected, you know, but no matter how detailed his parts were, they always fit the song without distracting or detracting from it. I mean, that was really his art. So three years ago, I did a whole video encouraging every guitarist to try playing bass. And I shared some cool examples of bass parts from great rock songs. Here's where I talked about Paul. If you want to create a melodic bass line, it can really be fun to wait to the end of the recording. You get all the tracks done and then record a new melodic bass part. This is exactly what Paul McCartney often did with the Beatles. And by doing that, he really changed the role the bass is allowed to play in pop songs. You know, listen to the bass part from A Little Help From My Friends. That is a great example of what happens when the bass is freed up to fill the holes and kind of dance around the melody and chords. So the verse is 
E, B, and F sharp, right? So, right? So that's what's normally going to be happening. So as of the second verse, he goes. What a cool thing that is, how melodic, you know, to go from the E to the B to the F sharp, and then he hits the ninth. Just unexpected on bass. Paperback Writer has a simple but killer bass hook. Rain, which was the B-side of the Paperback Writer single, is another great bass part. Okay, on the White Album, John's song Dear Prudence starts with a standard descending bass line played by John on guitar. You know this sound. So we might just expect Paul's bass part to double that, right? You know, D to C to B to B flat. But as soon as Paul enters, he plays this swooping bass line and it does follow the descending guitar line, but it also keeps anchoring us to a droning tonic note D, which he hits on the second and fourth beats of each measure like this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Like that. So the swooping bass serves as a perfect counter melody to the vocals. Love it. Hey Bulldog, one of Paul's most complex and bluesy parts. Now by the time we get to the Beatles' final recording, Abbey Road, McCartney is pretty much unfettered as a bass player, and his bass counter melodies are legendary. George Harrison wrote the ballad Something, and it's one of the most unusual and beautiful chord progressions and vocal melodies in the whole Beatles catalog. Now normally, a more complex structure of a song like that, the more the bass part would want to stick to root notes and fifths, not Paul, right? His bass part is so melodic and iconic, I usually find myself singing along with the bass, not the vocal melody. You know, it's funny, in an interview from the year 2000, Paul said, I think George thought my bass playing was a little bit busy. From my side, I was trying to contribute the best I could pretty humble. I mean, whoever decided to keep that bass part as is, I want to say thank you. I feel like it's a major part of what makes something such an epic track. And it fits so well. Most non-musicians probably don't even think about it. Now, beyond melody, Paul could also lay down a deep groove that made a song and recording way cooler than it would have been with a more typical bass line. Prime example, come together. So simple, but so groovy. So he picks the downbeat twice and then does a hammer-on slide up a fifth to A without picking, right? And then he picks the sixth above it, which that's the minor third blue note, and then he comes back to an A, but an octave higher than where he started, and then he repeats the whole thing like this. Here's Paul playing it. Gotta love it. Lays a great foundation and drives the song forward. Okay, there's one more vital lesson I learned from Paul, and I'm gonna give some credit to John for this too. It's to go wild and get weird. So in today's indie music scene, and I include myself in that category, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Beatles and their sense of humor and relentless experimentation. I mean, I often associate being groundbreaking and, and kind of a wacky class clown goofing around with John, right? But actually, some of the Beatles' wildest, weirdest, rockinest moments are thanks to Paul. I mean, we all know he could let loose vocally. The coda to Hey Jude is a prime example.
But check out Paul's guitar solo on Taxman. Good morning, good morning from Sgt. Peppers. That's Paul's distorted guitar solo, just on fire. And we can't leave out Helter Skelter. I mean, Paul wrote it after reading an interview with Pete Townsend of The Who. Pete had said they were working on the loudest song ever. And Paul responded by writing this. <laughs> Of course, that's often referenced as the precursor to hard rock, heavy metal, even punk. And finally, to end my lessons from Paul, here are his two-bar solo passages from the end. All right, those are three essential things I learned from Paul McCartney. Number one, to play with attitude and play your own way. Number two, the power of melodic bass. And number three, to go wild and get weird. I mean, we all have to let off steam and not take ourselves too seriously. And I think that kind of humor and joy are a major part of why we all keep coming back to the Beatles, you know, despite over five decades of newer music we could be listening to instead. Okay, even though I emphasize guitar discoveries on this channel, my next video will be what I learned from Ringo. So make sure you're subscribed. Do be patient with me because I shoot, record, and edit these videos alone. And at least for now, this channel is just a hobby. I have been at it for five years, so there are over 200 videos in the archives at guitardiscoveries.com and also here on YouTube. Or just watch this next.